nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. No picks, which uh, are arguably one of the most exciting part of, uh, of the field of metamaterials. Because in this case, we don't only design and engineer material with, with particular properties, but uh, more generally, we actually create a space for light. Because normally light propagates, you know, it's like kind of boring along a straight line, along the rays. So with transformation optics, you have this opportunity to design and engineer space in general for light. And you will see in a moment what I mean by this. But this is clearly a truly beautiful thing. Uh, I guess one of the easiest way to understand this, if you look at this Fermat principle, according to the Fermat principle, light propagates in such a way that it minimizes uh, its optical path. And the optical path is defined as the product of refractive index and geometrical path. And uh, we know that refractive index is the square root of epsilon and mu, of the product of epsilon and mu. And if now I create a space where epsilon and mu have some distribution, not homogeneous, but some certain special distribution, it means that the refractive index would be curved. And uh, according to the Fermat principle, to minimize the optical path, if refractive index is not constant anymore, uh, and of course when refractive index is constant, of course the what would minimize the optical path is just a straight line. And therefore, in homogeneous space, light propagates along uh, rays, straight light speed. If n is constant, to uh, have this Fermat principle fulfilled, uh, the shortest path would be a straight line. What if now n is curved? Then to minimize the optical path, the geometrical path also would be curved in such a way that the product of geometrical path and refractive index would be minimized. So, but that really creates these uh, absolutely fantastic opportunities that you could make light to propagate a very sophisticated path. So, not just these boring uh, uh, straight lines. And here an example what you could do is this. Uh, for example, you could, you, you could create a space in such a way that uh, light actually is sucked in. And that acts like an optical black hole. In a very similar manner, uh, when, uh, as uh, you know, like we, we have these uh, gravitational black holes, so here it, it, it acts like a black hole for light. Light just enters and never exits from that area. And that could be arranged if you have some the right distribution of uh, uh, the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability. You could also create this so-called light concentrator, when light could be actually uh, brought into very small area from uh, all the directions. And by doing so, you could create exceptionally high uh, energy densities. You could make this uh, hyperlens. Remember, I briefly mentioned this hyperlens. You could make them in planar fashion. You could make them uh, magnifying uh, hyperlens. All this is because you basically create this smart distribution of epsilon mu in space. When I uh, bring up this Fermat principle, it's a little bit um, simplification. So, and I will explain why. Because the Fermat principle is more or less related to geometrical optics, but it turns out that uh, the idea of creating a space for light is actually more powerful. When I say more powerful, I mean that you could do it on nanoscale, not only for sizes much larger than the wavelengths, which is typically what uh, what is associated with the notion of geometrical optics, but also on, on the nanoscale. And I, I, I'll speak on, on this more uh, a bit later. So for now, I just want you to appreciate by creating special distribution of epsilon mu in space, you could make light move along very sophisticated curves, so very different from conventional uh, simple straight lines. This is more examples. And by the way, all these pictures, it's not like cartoons. It's results of numerical simulation in this case, uh, done by, uh, like in this case, Jean Group. And here in Purdue, Professor Naimanov and Professor Kildashev, my, uh, my colleagues. This is planar hyperlens. That's also what we did with uh, uh, Alex Kildashev. And this is all real designs. It's all I mean, it's, 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 it's all with realistic materials with a realistic distribution of epsilon and mu in space. Here's more design, uh, done by 
uh, Professor Narimanov and Professor Kildashev and just appreciate how uh, unusual propagation of light can be when you create this distribution of parameters epsilon mu in space. In this particular case, light goes around a particular uh, of some object without uh, uh, entering that area. This is actually closely related to, to the idea of clocking, which I will be speaking a, uh, a bit later. In this case, light goes around from one side of this object. Here, you create distribution of epsilon mu in space such that light is turned back and comes in the opposite direction where it originally came from. This is yet another uh, illustration for this optical black hole. No matter where light comes into this area, it would get sucked and uh, goes to the center of this of this object. So that's 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 really the beauty of this. Of course, every time you have to solve a problem, what exactly distribution of epsilon mu should be so that the light would propagate in such a way, and what specific materials to choose to realize this distribution. But in principle, at least it's all doable, and that's what you could do with light by engineering the space by creating the right distribution of epsilon mu. You have a question? Where, where does the light go? Absorbed well, uh, what it happens in this case, of course, the energy would be accumulated until you break the material. So, and then, the, of course, the whole notion would stop working. But it means that you could create exceptionally high energy densities. So, uh, actually, there is a, a phenomenon in nature which is somewhat related, but as I will show, not uh, not exactly uh, in a complete analogy to what I'm talking about. And this is the mirage phenomenon. So in the, in the hot areas where you have uh, exceptionally high temperatures, what happens that closer to the ground, you have higher temperature of air. And then when you move away from the ground, the temperature drops a bit, which means that you have a gradient, gradient in temperature. But uh, refractive index depends on temperature, refractive index of air. And as a result, you would have refractive index different uh, at different height from the ground. And because of that, again, to minimize the optical path, light would not propagate along a straight line, but actually rather it would go along this curved, uh, uh, curved path. And that's kind of illustration what I'm talking about. But the important difference again, so that this uh, transformation optics certainly goes beyond this particular uh, simple mirage phenomenon or, or geometrical optics. And that's expressed actually in this equation. And uh, that was shown in, in, in a paper by uh, John Pandry in 96, in 1996. Although I should say that somewhat related work has been done by Igor Tom in, uh, in 1915. Basically, it's a pretty general property that if you have certain equations, here we're talking about Maxwell's equation, basically, uh, that could be invariant with respect to some particular uh, transformation. And if this is the case, uh, then that some very general interesting properties uh, could follow from here. Like in this particular case, if you look at the Maxwell equations, and let's say we have certain uh, uh, transformation of coordinate going from x to x plus, to x prime. For example, by uh, squeezing it or uh, stretching it or some other transformation. What actually it has been shown here that you, if in parallel you also do the appropriate transformation for dielectric permittivity and magnetic permeability, then in the end you would get the same equations, which means you, would, you should have the same solutions. So that's very unusual. So like you mentioned, for example, I have light in free space. It propagates along a straight line, and we know it's a very simple uh, case. However, I could create such distribution of epsilon mu, which is not homogeneous. So that the light, that and, uh, and if I would find out the such form of this transformation, that in the end I would get the same equation, that it means that in a very different physical situation, where you don't have homogeneous space, but rather certain distribution of epsilon mu in space, you would still have propagation like it's occurring in free space. Meaning that I have some object, but light still propagates like there is no that such object there. That's exactly the idea behind clocking. So again, the point here that if I do special transformation, if I in parallel modify epsilon mu, which enter the Maxwell's equation in a proper way and reproduce the Maxwell's equation, then I should get the same solution, which means I could have two very different physical situations with uh, same solutions. That's the idea behind of this engineering uh, of space for light. 
And the point here that it's not limited by the geometrical optics. I'm not now using the Fermat principle. It's, if it's true, then it's true for all sizes, including nanoscale, including the sizes much smaller than the wavelength. So the idea that you could design an engineer space is not limited by this like mirage phenomenon when you're talking about refractive index and you could explain it pretty much in the terms of geometrical optics. No, it goes beyond that. It's just a general property of Maxwell's equation being invariant with respect to certain transformations. And by the way, using the same idea, uh, people generalize this, uh, uh, this notion to other type of equations, like Schrodinger equations. So they suggested clock not only for light, but for electrons, for example. And electrons are described by the Schrodinger equation. Or you could apply it to uh, acoustic uh, sound equations. And in this case, you would create acoustic clock. So it's a pretty much general uh, uh, property, mathematical properties of a broad class of equations. And, uh, the, and that's actually what is uh, in the background of this beautiful idea of transformation optics. So let me, uh, well, illustrate this in some uh, interesting examples. Some of them are trivial and we actually have to distinguish true invisibility and what you could say kind of mimicking uh, invisibility like camouflage or some or optical mimicry they're all related but it's not like uh, invisibility in the sense what I'm talking about here and but still some interesting example from nature physics and technology related to something like clocking but not actually true clocking like in this case you have this uh, chameleon feature and we know that it's uh, capable of changing uh, its color so that it would match the color of surrounding and it's hard to see it. It's just like an example to bring it to the, uh, this world of clocking. Of course there is this uh, beautiful engineering thing which is uh, uh, F117 uh, stealth fighter and in this case you just design, you uh, use materials and shapes in such a way that if signal comes to detect this air aircraft actually it doesn't come back to, to, to the detector. So therefore you, it becomes invisible. But I should say there is, well, even though of course it's beautiful engineering, there is no any, let's say, uh, some, nothing like uh, really which breaks your imagination. I mean, it's how come, how it's possible. It's just like whatever signal comes, it would go in other direction. So it doesn't come back to the detector and you cannot detect it. So it's beautiful, great engineering, uh, but it's not really what we call uh, true clocking. Yet another example, that's almost like stupid, but uh, people seriously do it. Uh, uh, like, like in this case, what you actually do, you have a camera uh, which takes a picture, whatever is in the background of this person, and then through the computer sends it uh, to a projector, and then it projects on the clothes of this person. So basically you take image of the objects behind the person, then project it on the screen formed by the clothes of this person, and you have this feeling that you see through the person. But please agree, I mean, there is not even, there is no much science or engineering here. That's pretty much trivial. It has nothing to do with uh, what we are talking about. And I should say that there is a close analogy, actually, just yesterday we celebrated this uh, Nobel Prize in Physics given for the observation of the gravitational waves. I should say that so many ideas in optics uh, actually have been taken originally from the gravitation and the other way around. Because the equations are quite similar, this transformation I'm talking about, quite similar, I mentioned already black hole and optical black hole. It turns out that mathematically that these problems are actually quite similar. These two different areas uh, benefit from each other. And not speaking of that, the gravitational waves uh, have been observed because of the optics, because of the exceptional sensitivity which optics allows uh, uh, to have. So. Uh, the point here that uh, like this black hole idea could be also thought in terms of invisibility uh, because light cannot get out of a, a black hole. And uh, But still, I mean, this is uh, uh, cosmic scales and what I'm talking about, about invisibility in the uh, like real life scale and that's something different. Well, uh, coming back to this idea, simple idea that you see through the person by simply taking image whatever is behind the person and projecting on the screen. I'm showing this picture 
which again, in, to my case, it's uh, there is no science, no engineering here, uh, but uh, well, still, just to see it, it's a bit slow. Well, actually, okay. It's supposed to be moving. And when you move, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you have this illusion that you see through the person. So somehow it, the video doesn't work. Uh, all right, so let's move on. But uh, let's, that was kind of examples of something related to uh, invisibility, but not through clocking. That's basically something uh, different. And uh, I, I honestly should say I don't like sci-fi I, I, because many things irritate me there because they are uh, 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 against science. I mean, I yeah, have nothing to be it's simply impossible. But in, in this particular case, uh, it's interesting that these two pieces of literature um, actually formulated uh, in a very precise way the idea of clocking. And it starts with the actually true, really nice literature by Herbert Wells, and uh, it was written in 1897, uh, the famous The Invisible Man. And uh, this is the quotation from that book. It was an idea to lower the refractive index of a substance, solid to liquid, to that of air, so far as all practical purposes are concerned. So, and this is one of the conditions. So, to make object invisible, like myself, let's say I want to be invisible. So there are two conditions should be fulfilled. One is there shouldn't be reflection from me, because if light is reflected from me, you clearly see me. That's exactly what is formulated here. If my refractive index, it says, would match the refractive index of air, then nothing would be reflected from me. Uh, first of all, it's not precisely correct, but it's kind of excusable uh, omission, because what we know to uh, not to have reflection, what really you need not to match refractive indices, but rather to match impedances. And remember that impedance is uh, the, uh, the square root of ratio of epsilon mu. And uh, refractive index is square root of a product of epsilon mu. However, remember that in the optical range for all conventional objects, mu is equal one. Therefore, matching impedances or matching refractive indices is basically the same thing. Even the the Bible of theoretical physics by a textbook by Landau, you could read this that if you match refractive indices, there is no refractive index. It's not really true because with mathematicals, uh, when you have now magnetic permeability different from one, you have to be precise. What is really needs to be done is to match impedances, not refractive indices. But I, I guess we could excuse this small inaccuracy, right? Take into account that it's written by a writer and in 1897. But that's not the whole story. Not only light shouldn't be reflected for me, but you also should be able to see what is behind me so that I would not block anything. So then I would be really invisible. And that's another, that's actually the most sophisticated thing. Not to get rid of reflection, we have this anti-reflecting coating. That's an existing technology. You can do it. But how to see object behind me? Uh, and that actually comes from this uh, second uh, piece of literature. Frankly, I would not call it literature. It's junk in my opinion. But anyway, so uh, it, it has even this complementary title, Invisible Woman. And that formulates again precisely from scientific point of view what is needed. She achieves these feats by bending all wavelengths of light in the vicinity around herself without causing any visible distortion. That's exactly the second part needed. So first is nothing is reflected. Second, light goes around me, gets reflected from whatever in the background and comes back to you. So then I don't exist. Evaporated. You see whatever is, be whatever is behind me, but you don't see me. So that's the idea of uh, behind invisibility. No reflection and light should be able to go around me. So, and by combining the two, you actually would accomplish clocking. And that pretty much what uh, Sir John Pendry suggested in his uh, paper in 2006. And uh, uh, Ulf Lenhardt uh, in uh, the same issue of science actually also suggested a similar idea. But he used more like geometrical optics. And whereas Pendry used this transformation optics, one could say that, one could argue that transformation optics is more powerful, not limited by any, uh, by any uh, constraints associated with geometrical optics. I should also mention that there are earlier work on this, which were completely forgotten in the spirit what I was t talking about. Quite often, if you do something uh, way uh, earlier, 
then people got interested in this, it's forgotten, people don't pay much attention. And specifically, Dolin in, uh, in, 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 uh, like 40 years before actually, described very similar phenomena of this clocking. And that similar phenomena are also proposed for other, uh, physical uh, situations, such as thermal conductivity. As I pointed out, this property of transformation, uh, actually is, uh, uh, applicable to other equations as well. Anyway, but Sir John Pandre indeed drew lots of attention. That's what it created lots of excitement that it looks like in principle you could make objects invisible if you could pass light around the object without any distortion. So that's, that's the idea, and of course it's not that easy to accomplish, uh, but at least uh, in principle, theoretically, it's true. And what has been demonstrated out of that, after that, is kind of rudimentary things, not the complete idea. I should mention that you cannot do it for many wavelengths because it would violate causality. You could do this <laughs> clocking for one wavelength. Uh, but not for many wavelengths, uh, uh, because as I said, it would violate some fundamental principle. But it turns out that if you don't set such strict conditions, strict requirements, that complete invisibility, that you could get very closely to almost complete invisibility. And then it could be done for a broader spectrum, it could be done for different polarizations. And this type of things have been demonstrated, actually, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, well, I, I, I want to mention also our work, which was uh, done in our group. It's, it was a design. Uh, we didn't pursue experiment, although it's quite uh, doable. So it was suggested by my former student, Vinshan Tsai, who is now a professor at Georgia Tech. And he suggested an easier uh, realization of uh, clocking when you use, when you control only epsilon without controlling mu, because controlling mu in the optical range is a big, big challenge. <laughs> So it also has some limitation, it's not perfect clock, but it does actually result uh, to this type of behavior when light goes around uh, a particular area. So it turns out the uh, design is actually very simple. Uh, it's so simple that it's actually amazing. Uh, you have this uh, cylindrical structure, which is, let's say, hollow inside, and whatever you put inside of the cylinder would be invisible. So it turns out you could mathematically show it uh, that what you need to create is ref uh, it's refractive dielectric permittivity going from zero at the inner cylinder to one at the outer cylinder. Because uh, at the outer cylinder you have air, refractive index is one. It should be matching the air. But to make uh, light going around this area, you have to actually have distribution of epsilon going from zero to one. Then light complete, absolutely doesn't penetrate inside of this inner cylinder and goes around uh, uh, this, uh, this clocking device. And uh, to create such distribution in uh, uh, epsilon, or refractive index between zero and one, it's actually very simple. As Vinshan suggested, you just put these metallic roads uh, like, like like a hairbrush, like that ladies use, for example. So that, that, that you have this uh, uh, needles, metallic needles, and for metal, epsilon is negative, and you could see that the uh, metal filling factor here is higher than here. You put them along the radii. Okay, here of course metal filling factor would be higher here than there. So, and if you have, let's say, uh, made it of glass. The electric primitivity of two. So here, by uh, by putting the right amount of metal, which has negative epsilon, into the electric, which has uh, positive epsilon equal two, you could make it uh, the uh, my, the uh, the effective epsilon close equal to zero. It's just the question of putting the right amount of uh, of metal there. Okay, metal has epsilon negative and and large actually, like minus five or whatever. By choosing the right uh, filling factor, you could make the effective epsilon zero because you mix something positive plus two and negative, let's say minus ten, and uh, because it could be minus ten or minus hundred depending on the wavelengths. And it means that you should not put that too much metal because epsilon is really large in magnitude, and so the effective permittivity would be zero. But since the metal filling factor decreases here, you could make it so that the effective permittivity goes from zero to one. As required, as required, following some particular special distribution, which I'm not showing here, as mathematics requires when you do this transformational optics, uh, you could find out to restore this behavior 
as light propagates in free space, epsilon should follow some specific distribution going from 0 to 1. And it turns out that this similar design actually satisfied this idea. And that's what you have. If you don't have a clock, of course you have this uh, uh, shadow. You cannot see what is behind the clock. And if you do create this distribution of epsilon as I described, this is real simulations for real design. Light goes around and almost not distorted. You would be able to see what is behind the clock. So they, 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 it's important that the phase, you see it's a plane phase, is basically restored here, almost restored. It becomes again a, a plane wave behind the clock. So uh, the point here, it's not really a mystery. It's amazing, it's beautiful, uh, but it's not sci-fi. You really can do it. You just should make light going around an uh, object you want to clock, Basically, like water goes around the stone, and then you would be able to see what is behind the clock. But it's important to uh, completely restore the phase, so that if I remove the clock, the whole thing, the object, then light propagates in free space with certain phase velocity. So, and this clock with certain distribution of epsilon works in such a way that even though it's physically different space, Overall, behind the clock, you have the same propagation of light would propagate in free space. And that's the idea of transformation optics. Of course, it requires particular distribution of epsilon and mu uh, in space, but it's possible. And that's exactly related to what I said. When you do special transformation by creating this clock, and in parallel you introduce distribution of epsilon and mu, the right one, then I would get the same solution, like if light propagates in the free space even though it doesn't. So that's, that's kind of beauty of this, and that shows the power of metamaterials. Because not only you could create this negative uh, epsilon, negative mu, uh, negative refractive index, you could actually design and engineer space for light on nanoscale. You could have this optical clocks, you could have this optical black holes, light concentrators, uh, magnifying hyperlens. I should say it's very hard to realize, even nowadays, but at least in principle it's all doable. And I, I, I should say that it's truly fascinating. Well, as I said, the true clock is very hard to make, and uh, there are some kind of rudimentary versions of that. Like, for example, let's say I have a bump on the surface, like this one. But I would like to look this bump as just a flat, uh, flat reflected surface. Basically, I want to hide the fact that there is a bump here. So what I do, I put here a certain uh, object with certain distribution of epsilon and mu, uh, and mu it's, that compensate for this phase distortion which comes from this bump. When light is incident on this bump, it, it creates the change in phase of reflected light. And that's why you know there is a bump there. But if I would put here something which compensate for all these distortions, then it would look like uh, like there is no bump there. That's one could say it's not like a true clocking, but more like optical mimicry. But they think it's all doable, and in this case, it could be done for relatively short pulse. It could be done for uh, relatively meaning that broad spectrum, and that has been actually realized. That's what I'm talking about. This is flat surface, how it looks like. There is an object, uh, let's say this ball. And, of course, uh, light would be distorted and you could see this ball, but I could put the top of this a clock and that would act in such a way that light would be reflected from the object as if they were just this flat surface. And that type of clock actually has been realized. It's called optical carpet. Uh, by uh, two groups, uh, Shang Jenkin, Burgley, and Mihal Lipson at that time in Carnell. So, it's again, it's not clocking in the original sense, as I talked about, but you make something invisible. Uh, well, <laughs> this one character in uh, my favorite book, uh, novel, Russian novel, says, if you're dreaming, you should not limit your dreams. So, uh, and that was a beautiful idea. Okay, what is clocking? Uh, you create such a distribution of epsilon in space, in three-dimensional uh, 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 conventional space so that it becomes invisible for light for some particular wavelengths. But we know that the actual space is four-dimensional. So in principle, x, y, z, and t, time, related to each other. 
this so-called Minkowski space, we know this special relativity theory, Albert Einstein, all these beautiful things uh, related to this, but the actual space is four-dimensional, it's important. So what if I would create clocking not in three-dimensional space, but in four-dimensional space? What if I also introduce time domain? And that's a very nice idea. It was actually proposed uh, by uh, uh, Martin McCall. And it, it turns out it does make sense. Basically, the idea here, like with conventional lens, you could make light going around particular objects. That's nothing mysterious. Just putting lens, you could make light going around a particular area. That's in space domain. What if I now create these gaps in time domain? By, for example, slowing down light, propagating through optical fiber, creating a gap in time domain, and then some event occurs. Remember, a point in four-dimensional space is an event, because you have x, y, z, a special position, and t, time instant when it happens. It's called an event in four-dimensional space. So if I create, by slowing down light, a gap in time domain, uh, then I actually could hide something there, what happened at that time instant. And to recover it, like nothing was there, then I accelerate light so that I would re uh, erase that uh, gap which I created in time domain. So that uh, actually could be done with optical fibers. Just slowing down light, you know, you could change refractive index, you could slow down light, create a time gap, and then you could accelerate a light, and so erase basically that time gap. It's pretty much similar like what we have here. Oops. You see the you you see a, a, a flow of these cars. Then this car slowed down, and this event happened. This car which crosses the road, and then you accelerated the cars and you erased the the gap. So you like created time gap. Something happened there, and then you accelerated. So you erase the time gap. So the point here that this idea of clocking could be generalized from conventional three-dimensional space to four-dimensional space when you clock events. That's kind of interesting. And I should say that when this idea was proposed, Alex Gaeta from Carmel did some experiment which actually illustrated this idea. And Andy Weiner, my other colleague here, uh, 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 in 2013, published a beautiful paper that called it Temporal Clock at Telecom Data Ray. When actually they created a series of these uh, gaps in time domain where you could clock uh, particular events. That, of course, could be used for a secure telecommunication. That's, that's a wonderful work. So these ideas are not just fantasy, it's not sci-fi. They actually find applications. Truly beautiful and amazing things. So this is my other former student, Shin Jin Yi, uh, who moved to Berkeley to Shang Zhen, whom I mentioned many times. He came up with the idea of this uh, invisibility skin clock. Basically, it's like a carpet, but, but thin. It's like meta surface, which we will be talking about later. You put it on this arbitrary shaped object, and it consists of antennas, and each antenna shifts the face abruptly when it couples to light. And it shifts the face in such a way that it again would completely removes all this distortion introduced by the object. So, of course, the carpet should be unique, uh, for, uh, should be special for any particular special uh, landscape, let's put it this way, of the object you would like to hide. But anyway, in principle, it's doable. You put this metasurface skin clock and it becomes invisible. It looks like, uh, like, 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 like basically uh, like a planar surface. It's similar to what we can see that uh, invisibility clock, but that one was bulky. Here it's like a surface, meta surface. That's the difference. It's very thin, consists of these antennas. So, and, and again, if you're dreaming, <laughs> why you should limit your dreams? Uh, that idea was taken to yet another uh, level. When people say, okay, if you could do clocking, why don't you do all this what called optical illusion? Basically, you have one object, a man. But you uh, could make a look at like like a woman. I, I, I don't ask me why we would want to do this, but anyway. <laughs> so it's not only you could clock object in principle. You could actually could look, let's say, a cup like a spoon, or whatever. And and and, and again, in principle, it's all possible. You just should introduce such a space which would modify the phases in such a way that you basically hide the original object and make it look like a different one. 
And again, it's not just fantasy. People did simulation and showed that for a particular distribution, which might be next to impossible to realize in, in real life, you could actually have this illusion or optical illusion. Beautiful thing. And uh, one last thing. Uh, uh, which my friend uh, uh, Igor Smolininov uh, did with uh, with Naiman, Professor Naimanov. It's actually quite quite amazing thing. So, uh, according to modern cosmology, it describes universe as collection of spaces connected by black holes and wormholes, and these spaces may have very different topology and, and different number of dimensions. So, it's it's like it's shown schematically here. But the thing is that using transformation optics, we can create these optical spaces. We can mimic all the situation. Having non-trivial topology, which cannot normally fit, uh, uh, which cannot normally fit into Euclidean 3D space. So uh, that's actually quite an interesting thing. And uh, coming back to the cosmology to describe particles in, uh, in space, we use this famous Klein-Gordon equation. And you know that there is matrix X, Y, Z, and T. So, and you could say that it say that's plus it's for T and minus 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 for X, Y, Z. It's four-dimensional uh, uh, special uh, matrix. And as was first pointed out by Paul Dirac in 1945, actually, that in Klein-Gordon equation, if you have this uh, three minuses and one plus. And somehow, if one of the minuses uh, would switch to plus, basically you're going from matrix 3 plus 1 into 2 plus 2, then actually system should react to this violently, like lots of energy should be released and so on. He just was looking at this from the very general point of view, like Klein Gordon equation describing some global phenomena, four dimensional matrix X, Y, Z, and T. Uh, T has different sign. Uh, and, uh, and if you would switch from 3 plus 1 matrix minus 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 plus to minus minus plus plus, then there should be some very unusual phenomena to occur. But with metamaterial, you actually could mimic this. Because let's say we take an a, a equation describing uh, metamaterials, and you have this x, y, z, and you could have that dielectric primitivity in x, y plane uh, positive, but in Z is negative. That's what called hyperbolic material, which I already mentioned. They are exceptionally, they are extremely anisotropic material. They act like dielectric in transverse direction and as a metal in vertical direction. Uh, negative epsilon for Z and positive for XY. Or the other way around. And what if originally, and there is time, of course. And what if originally my epsilon was positive in all three directions, and in one of the directions then switch the sign, which is possible to do by straining or by putting some pressure. Then according to uh, what Dirac predicted, and taking into account this, uh, 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 this um, similarity in equation, there should be some unusual thing happen. And Smolanino speculated that there is this uh, famous phenomenon of cry crystal luminescence, which people cannot explain. But under certain condition pressure, it would, you would have these, uh, flashes of light coming for whatever reason. And he speculated that could happen because one of the epsilon changes its sign. And he would make parallel to this, uh, Klein Gordon 2T, Klein Gordon 2T equations when basically you change matrix. I mean, all this is speculation. So there is no really proof, but uh, I mean, it's kind of cool idea. But the point here to emphasize yet another time, uh, this similarity between cosmological, gravitational phenomena and optical phenomena. And of course, with optics, uh, you have this unique opportunity, basically on the table, to mimic very fundamental phenomena such as uh, Big Bang physics. Like you could have this toy Big Bang physics. So uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about. I guess most important thing here, uh, which I would like you to take home as like home message, is that you, by creating this distribution of epsilon mu in space, you actually uh, engineer space for light. So that light doesn't uh, anymore propagate along this boring rays, straight lines, but it could be curved. And you could create areas where light sucked in like optical black hole, or you could create area where light cannot enter, 
and the, the idea behind clocking when light goes around the particular objects. So, and you basically in this case only limited by your imagination and materials which you have to realize these ideas. But in principle, it's, it's, it's really a fantastic opportunity uh, to control light as it's shown in these pictures. Okay, so uh, next time we're going to look at metasurfaces, which is two-dimensional version of metamaterials. All these things are beautiful, but really hard to realize. That's the reality. Maybe in some days it would be easier and we would realize it. Maybe if we like, would have 3D printing on nanoscale, maybe we would be able to do it. Uh, but uh, metasurfaces, which is two-dimensional version of metamaterials, is very easy to make. And they resulted in a family of new exciting devices, as you will see on Friday.